Well, thank you everyone for returning. It's good to see you again. And today we'll continue with our course on the Moisampere equation, but we're going to uh, <coughs> take a much different perspective on the problem today and explore a different aspect, the regularity rather than existence. But to begin, let me just recall something for you yesterday that we stated, which is the following. So. So recall that we could solve the Dirichlet problem for the Mangempere equation for a certain kind of weak notion of solution. So let's say given a continuous function phi, let's say on the boundary of B1, where B1 is the ball of radius 1 in Rn, we could find a unique solution to the problem, say a unique Alexandrov solution, say u, continuous up to the boundary, of say determinant d squared u is equal to, now I'm going to focus on a very specific special right-hand side today. Let's say 1 dx. So our measure is just the big measure. With u on the boundary of b1 equals phi. <coughs> and just to remind you, because it's early in the morning, what does Alexandrov's solution to this problem mean? What it means is that if you look at all the subgradients of your convex solution u in a set E, and I take the measure of this collection of subgradients, that's the same thing as the measure of E. For any measurable set E and B1. So this is the meaning of Alexandrov's solution. OK. But today, our goal will be to understand what are the properties of the solution. So today, our goal will be to answer the question, when is this Alexandrov solution actually a classical solution of determinant d squared u is equal to 1? When is u a classical solution? And by that I mean when does the solution actually have two derivatives in the classical sense? Or even further, when can we say that it's a smooth function? For example, you may have seen uh, <coughs> that we can solve for a weak notion of solution for harmonic functions, Laplace u is equal to 0 in B1, with just continuous boundary data. But regardless of how bad the boundary data are, the harmonic function in the interior is smooth and actually real analytic. And here we want to explore the same question, but for the Mangempere equation. When this right-hand side is extremely nice, can we say the solution is necessarily smooth inside? Yes or no? And the answer actually turns out to be somewhat delicate. So we'll take our time developing the ideas. OK. So <clears throat> our approach to the problem of interior regularity is going to be completely different from yesterday. And we'll take a classical PDE approach. And in classical PDEs, typically what one does is assumes you have a smooth solution to the problem. And you can ask, when can I control derivatives of the solution in various function spaces? And if we can control a lot of derivatives of the solution, then we could hope that we can show that solutions of this problem are smooth by doing some sort of limiting procedures. So today we're going to 
assume almost the whole time that we have a nice smooth solution to this problem. So we'll say, let's assume that u is uh, c4, for example, in b1. And the reason I'm going to assume we have a solution with four derivatives is because I'm going to want to take derivatives of the equation. And let's assume that it solves determinant d squared u is equal to 1, or log of determinant of d squared u is equal to 0 in b1. <clears throat> and now my goal is to understand what about the structure of this equation will enable us to estimate derivatives of a C4 solution to the problem. So first, let's understand the structure of the equation. And before I go on, let me emphasize one more time that always I'm assuming u is convex. And we'll see why that's so important in a minute. OK. So to understand the structure of this equation, uh, the first step is to understand what is the linearized equation. This is a highly nonlinear PDE for you. And to understand the structure, we could think if we have this solution and we perturb a tiny bit and have another solution, what is the uh, difference between u and its perturbation solve? Another way to say that is if we differentiate this equation, what do we get? So if let's, as the first step, let's differentiate the equation. say, in the direction of a unit vector e. So e is a vector in the unit sphere. OK. So when you differentiate log determinant, <coughs> you get a certain special operator. Does anyone know what that operator is? Maybe it's a little bit tricky. Maybe on the right-hand side, I'll guide you. If we have log of determinant of, for example, the identity matrix plus epsilon times some other matrix n. Well, after choosing coordinates so that n is diagonal matrix, this is like log of determinant of 1 plus epsilon, say n11 plus epsilon n, n, 0, 0. So this is log of the product of these entries, or the sum of logs of these entries, log of 1 plus epsilon nii equals 1 n. And nearby 1, the function log, so here's the graph of log, but nearby 1, the function log has slope 1. So this is roughly the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of epsilon times nii, plus higher order terms. So we can see that if we perturb the identity matrix and take log determinant, we get epsilon times the trace of n. <clears throat> and more generally, as an exercise, 
we have log determinant of a positive matrix M plus epsilon N is log determinant of M plus epsilon times the trace of M inverse times N plus higher order terms. So the way you get from here to here is by factoring out an M and using the properties of determinant. So in particular, if you differentiate log determinant, we get trace. If we differentiate the equation once, what we get is the trace of the inverse Hessian matrix of U. So for me, Uij upper Ij is the inverse of the Hessian matrix of U. Ijth component times the derivative of u ij. This is sum from i and j is equal to 1 to n. Okay. Great. So what this says is the following. A derivative, a derivative of u solves a partial differential equation. You can think of it as a linear equation for some fixed u, where these coefficients of the equation are a positive matrix because u is convex. So this is a positive matrix. <clears throat> but we can say even more. So what we like to understand, so if we want to say something very nice about solutions to this, to this equation, we would hope that it's actually uniformly elliptic. Meaning not that just that this is a positive matrix, but that the eigenvalues of this matrix are bounded between positive constants. And we can in fact say that's the case if we know something about the second derivatives of u. So in fact, we have that the eigenvalues of this matrix, u inverse, less than or equal to, say, some other c0, less than infinity, if I claim that all these eigenvalues of this matrix are between positive constants, if the Hessian of u is bounded from above. u is less than or equal to, let's say, some c1 depending on c0. So why is that the case? Well, the inverse matrix having eigenvalues between positive constants is the same as the d squared u itself having eigenvalues between positive constants. So in particular, for sure, if the second derivatives of u are bounded from above, we have one of the inequalities that we want. But we also know some other information. There's the equation. So if d squared u is bounded from above, and determinant of d squared u is equal to 1, that means the eigenvalues should also be bounded, you know, better be bounded from below. So let me come over here. Say that this fact is precisely because the product of eigenvalues of d squared u is equal to 1. So the conclusion is that this equation for u is uniformly elliptic, provided the second derivatives of u are bounded. Equation for ue is uniformly elliptic.
if the second derivatives are bounded. Okay, wonderful. Sure. So, so U is a fixed U is a fixed exactly solution. Known. Yes. Okay. And then if U so what are the unknowns? So in this case, <coughs> um, I'm assuming U is known, everything is known here, and I just want to ask what type of estimates can we get for a known solution? And so it's a it's a little circular, I agree, but you'll see it. Uh, become clear in a moment. So I just want to understand what kind of equation this is. So everything, and there, there's, everything is known. Everything here is known. Okay. And I'm just computing equations right now. So step one, I just computed the equation for a derivative of u. And all I wanted to say was that this equation is uniformly elliptic if we somehow knew that the Hessian of u was bounded. Of course, I don't know that yet. But this is useful information. OK. So yeah, thanks for slowing me down, making this clear. So yeah, I'll, everything I'm doing right now is just computing equations. Alrighty. So this is useful information. If we could somehow say that the second derivatives of a solution to this problem were bounded or somehow control them, then it becomes a uniformly elliptic equation. On the other hand, if we knew this equation was uniformly elliptic, so the second derivatives of u were bounded above and below, that's still not a, a, a very good thing. And the reason is that this equation for the derivative of u can have coefficients which are uniformly elliptic, but could oscillate wildly from point to point. Because we haven't controlled the continuity of second derivatives yet, if we've just controlled their sizes. And so it's hard to get any further regularity of the solution or estimates on derivatives if this is just a uniformly elliptic matrix. And so there's one more step I want to take that will make the picture clearer for us. And that's by differentiating the equation one more time. So now let's differentiate equation one more time. OK. In other words, I want to take this equation and differentiate it in the e direction once again. And when we do that, we have two terms. First, when the derivative hits the second part, we just have a u upper ij, u e e ij. OK. But then there's one more term, which will be coming, coming from differentiating this inverse matrix. And that's a little tricky, but it's not so hard to do. I'll leave it as an exercise. But roughly, when you differentiate the inverse matrix, you have a negative sign coming out. And we have two inverse matrices appearing, ik, ujl, ue, I K U E oh sorry I J that's from the original equation U E K L is equal to zero. Okay. So again to save time I don't want to go through the details of the computation, but this term here is just coming from when a derivative hits this inverse matrix. So this is like the chain rule for the derivative of 1 over f of x? Yes, it's, it's very similar. You can think of it like this. <clears throat> or if you like, you could think of what happens to the inverse matrix if I make a small perturbation of the matrix. And you do the exact same type of Taylor expansion that I did before. OK, so but what's the, 
What's the conclusion after differentiating this equation? What's interesting about this second term? The key thing. <clears throat> the point is that this second term, let's see if you guys can notice something about it. So these are two positive matrices. Or if you like, one way to rewrite this would be the trace of d squared u inverse times d squared of ue squared. So this is a coordinate independent way of writing the second term. And what can you guys say about the trace of a symmetric matrix squared? Does it have a special sign? Anyone? Let me ask you this. If I have a symmetric matrix and I square it, what happens to the eigenvalues? The squares. So in particular, if I take the trace of the square of a uh, Exactly. Wonderful. So this term right here, or this object is positive, which gives me vital information on the equation for the second derivative of u. So let me come over here to write that. So in particular, we have that the second derivative of u has solves an equation, not really solves, but is a subsolution to an equation. uij, ueeij happens to be bigger than or equal to 0. So it's a subsolution to an elliptic equation. So u e e is a subsolution to an elliptic equation. <clears throat> and what this reflects is that the function log determinant is a concave function on the matrix space. And I don't want to go into the details because I don't need to use that explicitly, but it's worth writing down that log determinant is a concave function on the positive symmetric matrices. OK, so another way to rewrite everything that we've computed so far is that u solves, if u solves this equation, it solves an equation with special structure that people in PDE have understood for a while. This is the following. Is that if we somehow knew the second derivatives of u were bounded, again, we don't know this. This is just something that we would hope to do. U is less than some constant c. Then u solves a concave uniformly elliptic equation. uniformly elliptic PDE of the form C 
some function of d squared u is equal to 0. And in this case, this function is log determined. <clears throat> okay, and now I'm getting into some advanced PDE theory right now, but it's unavoidable if we're going to talk about the Mange-Ampere equation. And so I'm going to write for you a theorem about solutions to concave uniformly elliptic PDEs uh, that I'll allow you to take as a black box, but I'll briefly explain the idea before we can proceed. So here's a theorem we can apply. It's due to Craig Evans and Nikolai Krylov from the early 1980s, about 1980. Which is that if we have a solution to an equation of, it solves, it has these two structure conditions. Say if u is a function in uh, C2 of B1. solves an equation of the form f of d squared u is equal to 0, where this function f is a function of symmetric matrices, which is uniformly elliptic and concave. And again, for me, uniformly elliptic means if I differentiate the equation, UE solves an equation with coefficients that have eigenvalues between positive constants. I'm assuming uh, you know some basic PDE theory. And F is a concave function in the matrix space. And concave. Then we can say something very interesting, that the solution, not only does it have two derivatives, but we can control how the second derivatives move from point to point. We can say that the second derivatives are actually C alpha. Then u is, in fact, C to alpha and B1. say 1 half. When you move inside the domain, you would see 2 alpha, where alpha is a small positive number, which depends on dimension in f. And we have an estimate of the form u in c2 alpha of b1 half is controlled by some constant depending only on the dimension and on this function f times u and l infinity of b1. Yes. Let's add this. F of 0 is equal to 0. Thank you. OK. Wonderful. So this theorem was a cornerstone in PDE theory. And it's quite challenging to prove, but I think it's worth just explaining briefly why do we expect a solution to some elliptic equation, which is concave, to have continuous second derivatives before we go on. So the rough idea of this theorem is the following, is that 
If we differentiated this equation twice, just like we did for the Mange-Ampère equation, we would see that the second derivatives of u are subsolution to some elliptic equation. Now, I can't really differentiate uh, the equation twice because u is just c2, but I'll just do this formally. Formally? We have that a derivative of f in the ijth direction of matrix space times two derivatives of u, ij is bigger than or equal to zero by concavity of f. So this is the, the meaning of concavity of f is that two derivatives of solution are subsolutions to some elliptic equation. <clears throat> On the other hand, f is an elliptic equation. So roughly speaking, I expect that if I know all the eigenvalues of d squared u except for one of them, I should know the last one, because the function f will determine that. So but by equation, so just to be extremely simple, imagine that f is the Laplace operator, or f is trace. G, if f is equal to the trace. We, for example, have u11 is negative combination of all the other second derivatives. Sorry, what's the? What is f sub ij? Ah, thank you. So f sub ij is the derivative of the function f in the ijth coordinate of matrix space, the m ij, let's say, if f is equal to a function of matrices. So each of the second derivatives of u is a subsolution to some elliptic equation. But I'm thinking in my head, very roughly, that one pure second derivative looks like a negative combination of others, like in the Laplace equation. It is equal to 2 to n of uii. And so, not only is each pure second derivative a subsolution to some equation, it looks like a negative combination of other subsolutions. So it also looks like a supersolution. UEE is, in quotes, also a supersolution. To an elliptic equation. And this is the point, is that second derivatives of solutions to a concave equation look not only like subsolutions, but also like supersolutions. So they look like solutions to elliptic equations. And if we have a solution to an elliptic equation, then we have nice results we can apply to it. In particular, if we have a solution to a uniformly elliptic equation, then it happens to be Hilder continuous. But this is a very deep theory that we don't have time to go into. And this is, I would say, just the key idea behind the evans krilov theorem. So we can, I'll just put a happy face here because this allows us to apply theory of solutions to elliptic equations. Okay, great. So now what I'd like to do to complete this first part of today is to say what does this evans krilov theorem mean for solution to the Mange-Ampère equation? So 
a consequence of the Evans-Kreloff theorem for solutions to log determinant d squared u is equal to 0. Okay, so the consequence is this, is that this equation here is a concave equation and it's uniformly elliptic if the second derivatives of u happen to be bounded. And so this Evans-Kreloff theorem will apply to you, but the ellipticity constants of f depend on the second derivatives of u. This is the point. So we can say that <coughs> u in C2 alpha of B 1 half, for example, is controlled by a constant depending only on dimension. And the size of the second derivatives of u in B1. And the reason is that if we know the size of second derivatives of u, then as we saw, we know what the ellipticity constants of f are. So this determines the ellipticity constants of log determinants. So in other words, if we have a solution to the Mange Ampere equation, then we could control the modulus of continuity of second derivatives of the solution, at least in a small ball, B1 half, by how big the second derivatives are in B1. And this is the key to everything. And why do I say this? Let me just go a little bit further before moving to the second derivative estimates. Is that if u is c2 alpha of b1 half, and we go back and we look at the linearized equation, notice the linearized equation was uij to eij is equal to 0. And now the coefficients are not only some uniformly elliptic coefficients if the second derivatives are bounded, but they're Hilder continuous. And when we have a solution to an elliptic equation whose coefficients vary continuously, then this looks like the Laplace equation at small scales. And the reason is that if I zoom in close to a point, then these are almost constant because they're continuous. And we can use perturbation theory from constant coefficient equations called Schauder theory to get even higher derivative estimates. And again, I don't have time to talk in detail about this, but I'll say because these are in C alpha, we can apply what are called Schauder estimates. to say something better, that ue, the solution to this equation, gains two derivatives. That ue in C2 alpha of B1 half is controlled by a constant depending only on n and u in C2 of B1. Or another way of writing this, since this was an arbitrary direction, the third derivatives of u have some modulus of continuity. u in C3 alpha of B1 half is controlled by a constant depending only on dimension and 
C2 of B1. So, <coughs> the third derivatives are continuous. And what we can do is we can continue differentiating the equation and applying this perturbation theory and saying that once second derivatives are bounded for a solution de mange pair, second derivatives are Hilder continuous, third derivatives are Hilder continuous, we continue differentiating and applying perturbation theory, get fourth derivatives are Hilder continuous, and so on. So we can continue differentiating the equation. Yes, exactly. So, in fact, for the purposes of today, assume u is smooth and that we can differentiate this as many times as we like, and I'm just interested in the estimates of this form. So, maybe I'll write that. Continue differentiating the equation, assuming u is, uh, well, c4 is good enough, because then you can do some sort of difference quotients arguments to get more derivatives, but it's simpler just to assume u is c infinity. And we get estimates for this function, for the solution of the form u in, say, ck of b1 half is controlled by constant depending only on n, k, and u in c2 of b1. for all k bigger than or equal to 3, let's say. And this is the thing I want to emphasize, that is, of course, if you have an arbitrary smooth function, then we have no control on any of its higher derivatives, even if we know that its second derivatives are bounded. But the fact that we have a solution to the Mangin-Pair equation tells us that once the second derivatives are bounded, we control all the higher derivatives inside the ball. And this indicates that really the game for Mangin-Pair equation, or the key thing, is to say when can we say that solutions have bounded second derivatives. Once we know that, we're in very good shape. Of course, let me emphasize again, today I'm assuming everything is smooth and just getting estimates. Tomorrow we'll justify why we can assume things are smooth. At the beginning, let's just do a, a simple case. Let me just say the conclusion would be that the key is to get estimates on d squared u, the second derivatives, for solutions to log determinant d squared u is equal to 0. OK, great. So there are questions before I move on to when can we get estimates on second derivatives? OK, great. Well, before I talk about second derivative estimates, I just want to say one more thing about the structure of this PDE, which is extremely important. So we've already talked about how it's an elliptic equation and that it's concave. And we derived this consequence from the evans krylov theorem. Second derivative estimates are the key. One more thing we'll be using constantly in our analysis is the important observation that The Mangin-Pair equation has a special invariance group. So you can remember, if you have a, a harmonic function, 
and you multiply by a constant, then it stays harmonic. Or if you dilate, you stretch the domain, it stays harmonic. Well, it turns out for the Mangin-Pierre equation, there's a much richer family of invariances that keep the equation the same. And this, these actually fight against regularity for us, and we'll see why. So if we have, say, determinant of d squared u is equal to 1, then <coughs> we have an invariance under affine transformations. We have the function u tilde defined by, let's say, u of ax times determinant of a to the minus 2 over dimension, where a is some affine transformation. And this function u tilde solves determinant d squared u tilde is equal to 1. And this is just a short couple lines computation. <coughs> and the intuition behind this is that if I have some solution to the Mangin-Pierre equation, then I can imagine that if I take this solution and I stretched it a lot in some direction and squeezed it in another, so for example, if I took this solution and performed a change of coordinates which stretched a lot in some direction, and squeezed in another, then in the direction where we stretched, the second derivatives get a lot smaller, becomes flatter. But in the direction where we squeezed, the second derivatives become a lot larger. And the point is that they still multiply up to 1. So this is very, uh, I think, geometrically intuitive. But on the other hand, having an invariance group which allows us to stretch and squeeze functions uh, is going to make proving regularity results or estimating derivatives quite difficult. The reason is that we could, for example, take a nice quadratic, x squared over 2 as a solution, but if we stretch it and squeeze it a lot, we still keep having solutions, but the second derivatives get very large. And this I'll call the affine invariance of the equation. So I can refer to it later. OK. So that's the last remark I want to make on the structure of the equation. And now I want to talk about what I view as the most important result in the classical theory of Mont-Jampere which is the interior second derivative estimate of Pogorelov. So the theorem I'd like to talk about now is the theorem of Pogorelov. In the 1970s, 72. This is an interior second derivative estimate. And here's what it looks like. It says if determinant of d squared u is equal to 1 in a domain omega in Rn, which is a bounded convex domain, and u has nice boundary data u on the boundary of omega is 0. And let's assume that u is in C4 up to the boundary. Omega bar, let's say. 
Then what Pogorelov did was he managed to show that the second derivatives of a solution with this special boundary data are bounded. And he proved something kind of funny, though. He's proved that the function u, absolute value of u times uee, actually, I think I'll state it as follows. He proved that the second derivatives of the solution, d squared u at x, are bounded by a constant which depends only on dimension, on geometric properties of omega. So let's say omega, and on the distance between x and the boundary of omega. Omega now is, right, just a bounded convex domain. Right? And this is very important. So this is a good observation that now I'm not thinking of a solution in a ball. Pogorelov could only get this estimate for solutions which vanish on the boundary of some convex domain. OK. Oh, yes. Always use convex in my, yes. Thanks for, for pointing this out. Always use convex for me. OK. Great. So Pogorelov showed that provided we have a solution which looks like this. So we have some bounded convex domain omega and a solution u, which let's say is C4 up to the boundary. Then, at any point x, as long as we move in from the boundary a little bit, the second derivatives are nice. Say controlled. And as we saw, once the second derivatives are controlled, all the higher derivatives are controlled in a neighborhood as well. OK, so <clears throat> in the interest of time, rather than going through a detailed proof of this estimate, let me first write down some important consequences. Then I can say, what's the idea behind the proof? And then so one more thing. OK, so what does this tell us, this estimate of Pogorelov? Well, one very important consequence of this result is what's called the Bernstein theorem for the ampere equation. So, so one corollary of the Polgarelov estimate is the Bernstein theorem for Mange ampere. which says that if we had a global solution of determinant d squared u is equal to 1, that was c4, then it has to be very special. If u is in c4 of Rn is convex, and determinant of d squared u is equal to 1, then u is a quadratic polynomial. OK. Now, it was not entirely obvious how this corollary follows from the Pogorelov estimate. But roughly, I'm thinking in my head, if I had a global solution to this problem, and <clears throat> if it wasn't 
and say, uh, I want to say this. Well, you know, in the interest of time, I don't, I don't think I can say much more about this, but I'll say this is probably one of the most uh, important corollaries of the Pogorelov estimate. You could prove this beautiful rigidity result. Yes, exactly. So this is like the analog precisely of the Liouville theorem for harmonic functions. So recall that if we have a global harmonic function which is bounded, then it has to be a constant. Bounded harmonic functions are constants. And likewise, if you have a graphical minimal surface over all of Rn, then we know it's a linear function, at least in low dimensions. That's the Bernstein result for minimal surfaces. The global minimal graphs are planes, or hyperplanes. in low dimensions, up to dimension 8. So these types of results are very important in PDE theory because a lot of the time if we want to understand how a solution to a problem behaves nearby a point, we zoom in closer and closer and closer. And when we keep on zooming in, in the limit we get a solution that's defined on all the space. And if such solutions are understood very well, either quadratic polynomials, constants, or hyperplanes, then we can infer important information about the solution. Is there a Hamlet type inequality? Absolutely. So I would say what's behind the uh, uh, evans kreloff theorem is the Harnack inequality for uniformly elliptic equations with measurable coefficients. And that's roughly what's happening here is that uh, if you look at the second derivatives of a solution, then there are subsolutions to an elliptic equation. And we can show that, <coughs> well, that's, that means that the second derivatives, if they tend to infinity, they would have to go to infinity at infinity. They can't have any interior maxima. And roughly, having a global problem allows us to rescale and bring these points of high second derivative towards the origin. And then we could apply a Harnack type inequality to get a contradiction. This is a great, exactly the right words to use. But uh, I think writing all that out in detail would take a bit too much time. But in the notes that I have for this uh, similar course that I gave, I, uh, I think explain this result a bit further. You can look at those. Okay, and there's one more consequence of this Pogorelov estimate I think is somewhat interesting. Is that it tells us exactly a, a geometric criterion for regularity. So the second observation would be that <coughs> if and say, if the problem determinant d squared u is equal to 1 in a convex domain omega and Rn, convex and smooth, with zero boundary data, boundary omega is equal to zero, <coughs> is solvable, say, in C infinity of omega bar, then what? So here, I'm assuming, let's say, my starting point is Let's assume that we can solve the problem determinant d squared u is equal to 1 in a nice smooth domain with zero boundary data. 
then what does the Pogorelov estimate tell us? The Pogorelov estimate tells us that Alexandrov solutions to determinant d squared u is equal to 1 are smooth near points where they're strictly convex. Why is that? So the reason is let's say we have some Alexandrov solution to determinant d squared u is equal to 1. I'll call it v, let's say. Determinant d squared v is equal to 1 in Alexandrov sense. Then nearby a point where v is strictly convex, what that means is that there exists a supporting hyperplane to the graph which touches only at that point. And what we could do is we could take this supporting hyperplane to the graph of the Alexandrov solution we could lift it up a tiny bit. So let's lift this guy up. And we can find some region, which I'll call omega. So here is a function L, let's say, and we lift L up a little height h. And if you look at omega to be the set where v is less than L plus h, then we've carved out a set where this Alexandrov solution has affine boundary data. Say so equals L is affine. So what I'm thinking in my head immediately is that here we have a solution to determine d squared u is equal to 1 with affine boundary data. The Pogorelov estimate should tell me that the second derivatives of v are bounded in the interior and the solution is smooth in omega. But of course, the problem is that in order to get this estimate, we had to assume the solution had a lot of derivatives, four derivatives. And for Alexandrov solutions, we don't know anything about that yet. And this is why I'm assuming we can solve the classical Dirichlet problem in smooth domains. So what we can do is, say, solve the classical Dirichlet problem in smooth domains approximating omega. with boundary data given by this affine function L. And for these smooth functions, we can apply the Pogorelov estimate and then take a limit to conclude that this function V is smooth. Say apply the Pogorelov estimate and take a limit and the key point is that this Pogorelov estimate survives in the limit because the second derivative bounds depend only on rough things the geometry of the domain omega the distance between points and the boundary of omega and so on they don't depend on the particular solution so this estimates survive in the limit and we can conclude that v is smooth in omega.
plus h. Okay. And tomorrow we'll show in more detail, I'll actually do some detailed proofs tomorrow, that this problem is in fact solvable. So maybe I'll call this guy star. And tomorrow we'll show that star is solvable in C infinity of omega bar. And the conclusion would be that if we have an Alexandrov solution in B1, any Alexandrov solution, if, let's say, U is an Alexandrov solution, to a determinant d squared U is equal to 1 in B1 of Rn. Then we can say precisely where the solution is smooth by looking at its point of strict convexity. Then u is smooth on b1 minus some singular set, which I don't know anything about yet. And this is the set of the open set, let's say b1 minus sigma is an open set of strict convexity. For you. Ah, it's a great question. In this picture? Yes. So where I used strict convexity was that when I lifted this supporting hyperplane a little bit, we found a domain where this Alexandrov solution had linear boundary data. Whereas, so if, if it was not strictly convex, that, that domain can, can be no? exactly. So this is this is the reason that uh, this domain absolutely it could conceivably have some corners and so on, and so that's why we need to do an approximation procedure. Uh. We smooth out the domain, solve the classical Dirichlet problem, and take a limit. And the key point about the Pogorelov estimate is that it doesn't care if there are corners in the domain. And I haven't said this, I should really say this is like diameter of omega. Things like this, but the second derivative bound doesn't care if corners exist in uh, the boundary of omega. And so when we take these smoothed out domains and take a limit, the second derivative estimate survives. You want me to come back here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so coming back here. <clears throat> if, for example, the, uh, we're, we are looking at a point where u is, or v, this function v, were not strictly convex, then it's not so clear that we can find a domain containing the given point that has affine boundary data. If we lift it up this plane, then the boundary data wouldn't necessarily be an affine function. So we couldn't apply the poker law fest. That's a good point. So this uh, singular set uh, always exists? Are there convex so, so this is exactly the next topic that I'd like to ah, finish today with. No worries. So, so what we have so far, well, the point of this Pogorelov estimate is exactly this statement. I view it as this one, that Alexandrov solutions are smooth where they're strictly convex. On the other hand, we haven't ruled out the possibility that there are Alexandrov solutions to determine d squared u equals 1 
which have line segments in the graph. This is the only enemy to regularity. And I want to finish today by giving an example which shows that these line segments in the graph of an Alexandrov solution can actually happen. They're a real worry. So a natural question, so the obstruction to regularity for Alexandrov solutions to determinant of d squared u is equal to 1 in B1. Is the existence of a line segment in the graph. Of line segments. The graph of U. So this set sigma exactly is a set which consists of line segments in the graph of u projected to the domain. And an important example, so important, that these line segments occur in dimensions 3 and larger in general. These line segments can happen in dimension n bigger than or equal to 3. On the exercises, I guide you to showing that in two dimensions, Alexandrov solutions to this problem are strictly convex. In particular, in two dimensions, solutions to determinant d squared u is equal to 1 are always smooth. But I want to show you now with an explicit example that in three and higher dimensions, line segments can happen in the graph. OK. So the example was also due to Pogorelov around the same time as a C2 estimate. So he understood that his C2 estimate, which relied on zero boundary data, was really heavily conditional on that uh, special situation. And the idea of the example, I think, really comes from the affine invariance of the equation. So the idea is to look for Look for solutions with the homogeneity say, as follows. So we'll say u of x prime xn in Rn is homogeneous in the x prime directions, but not the xn directions. So it is invariant under the rescalings u of lambda x prime xn times 1 divided by lambda to the 2 minus 2 over n. So why would you look for solutions with this homogeneity? Well, first off, this is exactly a rescaling which preserves the equation by affine invariance. If I have a solution and I do this transformation of variables, I get a new solution. So this guy is, let's say, <coughs> solves determinant d squared u. Well, maybe I'll say it like this. 
This transformation preserves the equation. So this type of transformation preserves the equation. And what this <coughs> uh, homogeneity means is that the solution is invariant under stretching in one special direction, but not doing anything in the other. And if the solution has this homogeneity, you can see that the second derivatives in the x prime direction are supposed to blow up. Second derivatives in the x prime direction blow up. If I took two derivatives in the x prime direction, we would say that they're homogeneous of degree minus 2 over x. Let's see how this example looks more explicitly. So the form of the solution that we're interested in will be something like follows. x prime to the power 2 minus 2 over n times some function of xn. So when we impose this homogeneity and also axis symmetry, that means that the solution we're looking for would have to take this form. And this function f, I'm going to choose to be a nice, smooth, convex function of one variable. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. Yes. OK. So we look for a solution of this form. <coughs> so what, roughly what a function like this would look like if, if we drew the graph is this function would vanish on the xn axis, where x prime is equal to 0, this guy is 0. So if we try to draw the graph of u, and it takes this form, then it vanishes on the xn axis. Let's say, and this function f is some positive smooth function. So as we move in the x prime directions, what u does is it grows with homogeneity or power 2 minus 2 over n. So it looks like this. So use a function which is 0 on the xn axis, grows away from the xn axis like moving distance d out and d to the 2 minus 2 over n up. And what's happening with this solution is that the second derivatives perpendicular to the xn axis grow very big. If you take two derivatives of d to the 2 minus 2 over n, you get d to the minus 2 over n times some constant. So the second derivatives in the x prime directions get very large. But the second derivatives parallel to the xn axis get very small, or that one second derivative does, because the solution is getting very flat along the xn axis, 0 there. And still, all the second derivatives multiply to 1. This power is chosen just correctly so that that happens. <coughs> and so when we impose this symmetry, or this homogeneity, finding a solution is reduced to solving a certain ODE for f. If we write determinant d squared u is equal to 1, then it becomes some ODE for f. some ODE for f. And that ODE has the form f to the power n minus 2 times f, f double prime minus, I think of something like 2 minus 2 over n over 1 minus 2 over n. f prime squared is equal to some positive constant. 
depending on dimension. This is a very good exercise to do. <laughs> and the point is now that this ODE is certainly locally solvable. And so at least near the origin, so for example, if we impose, if we solve this ODE with the initial conditions, whatever we like, let's say f of 0 is equal to 1, for example, and f prime of 0 is equal to 0. <coughs> then we get a solution nearby the origin. Two determinant d squared u is equal to one, where say xn is small. So let's say we locally solve this ODE. So for an ODE like this, we have a short time existence of solutions. We can solve it nearby xn is equal to 0. And then this will give us a solution to determine that d squared u is equal to 1 when xn is small. And on the exercises, I actually guide you to showing that the solutions of this ODE blow up in finite time. So actually, if you solve for this function f with initial condition value 1, derivative 0, <coughs> then you can see that, OK, at the beginning, f prime is 0, f is 1. So to solve the problem, f double prime would have to be positive. So it starts to curve up a little bit locally. And it turns out the fact that this constant is larger than 1 will cause, the, cause this curving up to happen more and more and more quickly until the solution blows up after a short time. And so we can find a solution to determine d squared u is equal to 1 with a line segment in the graph, but the solution will not be global. This f is only, we can only solve for this function f locally. And there's actually a lot of reasons that we should expect this to happen. One of them is something Hector talked about yesterday. If you had a convex function, which vanished, say, on all of Rn, which vanished along a whole line, then that function would have to be translation invariant in that direction. And I remind you of this on the exercises. Okay. But I think this is a, a natural place to stop. And I just want to, to maybe just say that um, tomorrow we're going to pick up with the global and boundary regularity of solutions. So I want to justify this statement that so Alexandrov solutions are smooth nearby points of strict convexity. We needed to use the solvability of the Dirichlet problem with smooth boundary and smooth boundary data. And OK, I'll stop. In the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to come talk to me uh, during the recesso. I'll be available. So. Uh, I know it's a tough topic, Mon Jean-Pierre, and today I had to talk, uh, I say I had to use some advanced results. So don't worry if you haven't seen them before. If you want to come talk, you know, talk with me, I'll explain them in a bit uh, more detail. So.